Um, so welcome everyone. This is our partner webinar series and today's session is on straight talk on automation, getting the right stuff done with AR, AI, RPA and ML. I don't know what AR is. Um, I'm Michelle Kirk. Um, I am currently working for Georgia Pacific out of Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm the Director of Information Governance and our Chief Privacy Officer. Um, my side job is that for the last 10 years or more, um, I have been a serial volunteer for ARMA International. Um, ARMA has really done a great deal for me and for my career. Um, it's helped me grow my overall career, um, my IG knowledge um, made me some lifelong professional and personal friends. And, um, and it's really given me an opportunity to continually self-actualize and, and continues to, um, because one of my favorite topics to talk about is, is um, this topic today. If you're not a current ARMA member, I'd highly encourage you to visit arma.org to learn about all the benefits of becoming a professional member. Um, one of the benefits is choosing the future leaders of ARMA. And if you are an ARMA member, you should have gotten some notifications that nominations for 2021 and 2022 board of directors are currently open. Um, and for any of the of you joining us today who are already ARMA members, please remember that you can nominate yourself or other people. Um, um, so just visit arma.org for additional information or look out for those emails. ARMA would like to announce that this holiday season, they would encourage you to give the gift of IG knowledge. Starting next week on Black Friday, all items in the ARMA online store will be 25% off. You can use the code ARMAHOLIDAYS25, all one word, to take advantage of the discount. Um, and you can visit uh, ARMA.org for more information on that as well. Um, one last reminder before we get started is to mark your calendars for Infocon 2022 in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, that will be from October 16th through the 19th. I know I am so hopeful that we get to see each other in real life, and hopefully all of you are too. Um, we have gone to Nashville not long ago and had a really great time. It's a pretty amazing venue and um, hope to see you all there. Before we get to today's session, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. If you have a question for our experts, please make sure you put it in the Q&A box. There's a chat box and a Q&A box, and I'll be monitoring that Q&A box. Um, we will be sending out the presentation and a link to view the session after the session, so keep an eye on your email box. I know that's a a pretty um, frequent question, are you gonna get the slides? Um, and I'd also like to take a second to thank the people at Knowledge Lake. It's because of their support as our business partner that we're able to bring you additional programming and services above and beyond what ARMA already brings. Um, when considering products or services for your business, we hope that you would consider partners like Knowledge Lake who support you and your ongoing education and your career. Okay, so today I am joined by two wonderful speakers. Steve Weissman is a principal consultant at Holly Group, where he helps you do information right by bringing order and discipline to your governance and process practices. Um, Steve is known as the InfoGov guy, and he has spent the last 25 plus years equipping his clients to better their ability to find, leverage, secure, and assure business critical information and to successfully solve the people part of the puzzle. He's honored as an AIM Fellow and a recipient of AIM's prestigious Award of Merit. Congratulations, Steve. Thanks. Um, we also have Ron Cameron, um, and Ron is a serial entrepreneur with more than 20 years of experience in the information management industry. In 2001, he founded a company called Knowledge Lake, um, a leading provider of intelligent document processing solutions, IDP. Um, today, he continues to serve as the CEO of the company, but also volunteers as a member of the board of directors for the, Associ the Association for Intelligent Information Management, AIM, as well as several other nonprofits. I'm now going to turn it over to Steve, the InfoGov guy, who will define for us what AI RPA and ML really means, and this is the part that I love because we're going to learn something. Let's go. Thanks, Michelle. No pressure. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. <laughs> and Steve, I wanted to say uh, it's so it's so good to have you today, and uh, looking forward to having some fun on the call. So, oh, absolutely. Um, I have to say, Ron and I 
no surprise. I mean, we all have got together to, to plot this out and uh, say, I wonder what happens if we run out of things to say. And he's like, I don't think that's going <laughs> to No, I think we should be done about eight o'clock tonight. So we'll get everybody. Well, I thought we had till uh, uh, Saturday. <laughs> anyway, folks, don't get afraid. If, if you've seen me present before, okay, get a, be afraid. <laughs> um, this is also one of my favorite topics because there are uh, the expectations re regarding these technologies are so often so offset from reality <laughs> that uh, when, when i got asked would i want to do this i think they didn't even finish the sentence before i said yes um so i don't know quite where this came from but this is how i promoted the event in in my social stuff you know, besides being the InfoGov guy, I am a destroyer of myths, a setter of expectations. Dun, dun, dun. Should have done this at Halloween. Play some scary music. You know, the Wilhelm scream. Uh, I don't know if you can hear that. Apparently my cats are not getting along. Speaking of the Wilhelm scream. <laughs> okay, so the first thing I want to point out um, Despite what you may have heard or what you may have been led to believe, there ain't no magic pill here, folks. You know, you hear artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, robotic process automation. These are all things. First, oh, they're coming. They're on the horizon. It's going to dramatically transform the way we eat, sleep, breathe, everything. Um, and it's just not true. You know, it says straight talk in the title of this this webinar, and that's the straightest talk I, I can think to, to give you. Uh, there is no technology that, however good it is, and most of them are really good, but there are none that are going to take the human being out of the equation and, and shouldn't. Um, I mean, just turning this on today, you know, to, to come live to, to see you folks today, my PowerPoint crashed. <laughs> I mean, it's just PowerPoint. I don't know why it did. It just did because stuff happens. So I don't think I want to leave some of my most business critical systems up to that kind of fate and have it crash or have it die or have it do scramble, you know, stuff without human eyes on it. Well, Steve, I, I totally agree with you, man. There's no, absolutely no magic pill with any of this stuff. And man, if there's a something we could accomplish um, today for the, for the folks that are listening are, man, let's, let's, let's kind of separate fact from fiction through our discussion. And because there's some really good technology out there uh, across the market, but there's no magic, but it's still great. It can still help you get a lot of work done with, with fewer resources. So yeah, it's, there's no magic pill, but there are some, there is some really good stuff out there. Yeah. And that's the thing. It, for, for all the fun, we're going to have poking holes in these theories. The technologies are good for the most part. You know, they'll do what they're purported to do. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to solve all your problems, though. There is still work to be done with them. And in fact, a lot of times when I circle back with organizations at places like Arma, let's say, and I say, oh, I remember you were starting that big initiative. How'd that go? And a lot of times what I get back is, well, it didn't go. I mean, it was okay. It didn't go as well as we'd hoped. And, and my favorite is, oh, it didn't really work. And then I find out, no, the technology actually worked fine. It was everything surrounding the technology that, that didn't work, didn't get done. The upfront thinking, what, you know, my, my, my catchphrase is what business problem are you trying to solve? And if you can't answer that with some specificity and some metrics, nothing you do with technology is going to leave you feeling like, wow, that was a win. I agree. Well, we're suffering, you know, the whole marketplace suffers from the marketing hype that occurs when any kind of new thing hits the market, whether it's a, you know, say a self-driving car, you know, I'm sure many of us on this call have a Tesla. Uh, it's a pretty common car these days, but you know, everybody knows if you turn on that automatic driving thing on Tesla and you ignore it, you're going to crash into a tree and kill yourself. It's not, it's good. It's a good feature. It's like extra good cruise control. Man, if you think that's going to drive the car for you, you are going to die. So <laughs> It's the great analogy to where we're at. You know, the marketing people have got this stuff spun up to the moon uh, and it's really good, but we do have to know where fact is from fiction. So just like the, just like the driving cars. Yep. 
good, great, great example. Never mind hackability and all that stuff. Right. Um, okay, so let's get to the ones that we're talking about today. Um, artificial intelligence. So here's a, 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 a dictionary definition or an industry definition of what AI is. And basically it's machines that mimic the way human beings think, which I think is funny because there's millions of dollars being made to try to understand how human beings think. So I don't know why we think we can teach a robot to, to think like we do. So this whole thing is an editorial if you haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> Anyhow, rather than me droning on about it, I have um, 30 seconds worth of, of explanation um, drawn from the BBC of all places. So let me play that for you. It is not about building a robot, but creating a computer mind that can think like a human. From Apple's Siri to Facebook's friend recommendations, it's in our cars, our homes, even air traffic control. And so we come to the challenge of creating a human or general AI, a computer mind that thinks like a human, that learns, that improves, that could even become superhuman. Scared yet? I, I love this because of where it ends. And this is the subject itself of great debate these days. Should we be afraid of artificial intelligence? Are the robots going to take over the world? I mean, there's been a, a whole bunch of movies about this, you know, with this as a premise already. Um, and what I want to say is, don't, don't, don't be afraid, the way Robin Williams would always charge around the stage saying, I don't really think we're in trouble of that, especially when you consider, I was gonna say, see these two guys, they're like state-of-the-art robotics, supposedly in, in a galaxy far, far away. Um, and it's, are, are they scary? Are they evil? You know, I have this theory that is, that suggests people get nervous about this because they behave like humans. I mean, even R2-D2, we laugh because he says something funny, even though really he doesn't say anything at all. And C-3PO, he looks, he looks like a person. So my question is, what, what if we took the intelligence of the robots of the future out of their heads and put it in a box? Then what? Is, is, is that any less scary? It's the same functionality, but somehow it's different. Um, and Stephen, what... What that previous little video showed was, uh, you know, the depiction of what we all expect from what's called general AI, right, which is mimicking a human. And, you know, that that's a great lofty goal. Maybe we'll get there someday. Uh, hopefully it's hopefully it's a long time because uh, kind of like humans. But, uh, man, we can use a subset of this AI notion for doing really, really clever things like, you know, it's really good at like classifying documents. I got a big stack of paper. What, what, which one looks like an invoice and which one looks like a purchase order. It, it can do that stuff all day long. And we don't have to worry about that thing taking over the world and killing all of us. It's, it's just a thing that does something. And it's funny that's you should say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because we've never met before. Isn't that right, sir? <laughs> because what you just described is really machine learning. Yes. It, the, the, it gets we attribute a lot of what we see through machine learning as being artificial intelligence, but it isn't really, well, I have another video for you. Uh, this is from uh, the good folks at Google explaining how this works in case there are those amongst you um, who are still trying to demystify all this for yourselves. Um, so I'm, without further ado, I'm just going to click that one. By the way, um, for some of you, it may look to be a little bit out of sync. That is almost certainly a reflection of the nature of the connections that we all have individually to, to this platform. Some, it'll be great, and others, you may find it a little weird. Um, just want you to know it's, it's tuned the best that we could tune it, given all the variables. Um, but the point still will be the same. So machine learning is all about learning from examples. Rather than writing 500,000 lines of code, we instead have the machine learn from observations about the world. 
And we looked through a bunch of these examples in the machine learning algorithm, maybe millions, maybe billions, maybe even trillions, to identify the patterns and generalize from there. In the task of image recognition, we've been able to train models to take the pixels of an image, and from those pixels, learn high-level features. <clears throat> it starts to learn that if you see a cake and you see a kid, it's maybe a birthday party. If you see a cake and lots of kids, it's very likely a birthday party. And so this stuff is real right now. You know, the, the way the algorithm, yeah, easy for me to say, <laughs> the way the algorithms are written and the analyses conducted, you set this, the threshold that you want in terms of how confident is the system in what it determined this ought to be? Is it a birthday party? Um, they're amazing. And what's even more amazing is they work for documents too, just as we just talked about. If you see a lot of documents and they have certain characteristics, they're probably an invoice or a contract or an application for something, which is to say something identifiable and, and something your system can identify so you don't have to. Now, somebody should business. still, be, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, we, you know, we probably all of us on this call, we, this is our business. This is likely our profession, you know, look, looking at documents and working with documents. And I've been, I've personally been doing this for 25 years and it's, it, this machine learning is, is the best thing clearly that's ever impacted our business. And it started about five years ago and, you know, used to, we'd rely on OCR results to try to figure out a sort of what kind of document it was. And it, it sort of worked. It was better than nothing, but machine learning takes it to a whole new level. I mean, this, we can get exact, really exact results about document classification and then, and then eventually about the extraction of the metadata. So it, it's a really innovative and really clever uh, new way that this technology is, is impacting the businesses that we're in right now. It's, it's really, really impactful. And I'm a professional skeptic. And just a short while ago, I had spent two years actually using a tool that does this sort of thing mm -hmm. for, for actual clients with these sorts of issues. And even as a professional skeptic, I have to say I was blown away. And it's really up to you to, to set how precise is precise. You know, one of the things that I was reminded of too during this period, um, if you're looking for 100% accuracy, you're not going to find it. It's the wrong benchmark to use. The benchmark you want to use is how accurate are you now? And can this improve upon that? And the answer is undoubtedly. And you play with the algorithms until you consistently achieve results that I always said are good enough. Good enough is good enough. You'll go broke if you shoot for 100%. But you can get in the high 90s, really, without trying terribly hard. So how you determine that, that's the human element, which is why I wanted to excited, kind of start with that. Somebody's got to be looking at the results to make sure it's working properly, to see if there are patterns in the exceptions that get thrown out, because maybe you can write a new rule to address that exception. So there's still plenty of, of room for the human being. And it's not even that there's, there's room for us. It's that we have to be there because they're not perfect. The machine will do what you tell it to do, whether or not it's right. <laughs> the good news, though, is by turning these kinds of processes over to the technology, I mean, you can just imagine the time you can save by letting these machines do this work, do the classification, extract the metadata. And also, by the way, it's not just for conventional documents. The same thing can be made to work with additional kinds of magic on audio files, on video clips. You know, okay. more and more, we're, we're in there as humans too. You have a car accident, you call up your app for your insurance company and you take a picture and you, you click the button and it gets sent to the insurance company and the insurance company can extract from that, well, who is it? And look up what's their account number or their policy number and what's covered and blah, 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 blah. It's a really big deal. But what it isn't is artificial intelligence. It's machine learning. And that's an important fact to hammer home because 
the two are often marketed as being the same thing and they're not. Um, virtual show of hands. <laughs> You're at, it's honor system. I'm gonna imagine that a bunch of you are raising your hands. You're familiar with um, IBM's Watson? Bunch, bunch of, a couple of years ago now, I guess. Um, I can see Michelle smirking in the distance here. <laughs> she knows what I'm gonna say. Watson won at Jeopardy. And it was very, very cool. And there were all kinds of balloons and parties. and, But you know what? That wasn't artificial intelligence either. It was machine learning on a mega level. They fed the world's knowledge into Watson, a very, very powerful search and intelligence engine that could ingest the question, analyze the keywords, and go search this enormous, you know, ridiculous corpus of information to come back with an answer that it gave a score to. Highest score, that must be the answer. And it often was. So I'm not denigrating artificial intelligence and its potential. But what I'm trying to do is anchor us firmly in the real world, which is to say, don't be fooled. AI has become as much a marketing term as it is a technology. And from a day-to-day -day perspective, it really doesn't even matter. There's a test at the end of this, and here's the first quiz, because what is it that's the starting point? I said it at the beginning. What business problem are you trying to solve? I don't care if it's AI or machine learning or a hamster on a wheel. If it's going to solve the business problem, that's the one I want. So you want to kind of take all the excitement and the and the, the the partying around AI, and even the, the 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 fear, the scare tactics, and put them aside. Is this going to help me solve my problem? Yes, good. Let me learn more. Or no. Next, Ron, you're going to say something. Yeah, I was going to just comment on your your Jeopardy example with Watson. I I, I think it's you know it's. I, obvious great example of marketing by IBM because uh you know it really this doesn't really have a whole lot to do with AI but maybe it does you know but when, when you look at that mechanism called Watson how good would Watson be if it didn't have that ginormous corpus of data okay so it it's the it's the machine it's the it's the AI thing but plus the information is what makes the power okay and I see all this marketing stuff all the time and it just makes me uh, crazy scratch my head because, you know, all of this, you know, we, we've got this and it goes like this. We've got this AI or machine learning thing and it can it can start it can start the first day and start start producing results. And while mm -hmm. it may be true that you could start producing re results pretty quickly, OK, because some, some but the point is something has to teach the machine what to do. OK, there always has to be data, it has to be data for the machine to act on. It's like driving your Tesla with, you know, you, you can't cover up those cameras. The data has got to come into the car so it can decide which way to turn the wheel. Okay. So uh, anyway, the, it's important to have the AI thing, but you also have to have the corpus of data and don't be tricked in the market by watching these new AI things that are in the market. They all have to have a training set somehow. So anyway, just, just keep your eyes open uh, to that phenomenon that's happening right now. And just to that point, trying to draw even a dotted line between AI and machine learning. You can see I, I, I labeled them, shoot at these, because I'm not suggesting this is like the be all and end all, but really broadly, machine learning is self-learning. You, you feed it instructions and you, you write rules and, and things so it can get better over time. The, the more it sees, the, the better, the more accurate it can become. Whereas AI, to Ron, to your point, exactly, I think that's more about self-teaching. And that's as far as I'm willing to go right now. Because <laughs> it's thorny and largely irrelevant. Let me draw one more analogy, okay? So the AI thing is like, you know, an enormous, like in the Jeopardy example, it's an enormous database of facts. And the ability to search those facts and to get an answer is like it's like a giant database search, but all the all the data has to be there. Yep. The machine learning uh, is more like playing chess. Okay, it's about patterns on the board. Okay, I've seen this pattern before. What's what's my next best move? That's a great example of machine learning. It's like 
the observations of patterns of things over time, which, which can recommend thing, which can recommend a next step or recommend, recommend a, with a certain probability that something's the same as it was before. So I, so now I know my next move. So it's jeopardy versus chess, AI versus machine learning, machine learning is the best way I could, ex you know, to yeah. explain it. I have a great example. Um, and I would only use this, um, if it, if it were, and it is in the top 10 of Netflix recommendations <laughs> this week, um, but it's a movie or a series called clickbait. And one of the characters, his entire job is looking at a screen and saying, yes, it's acceptable. No, it's not. And he is clearly a, a person teaching a machine learning algorithm, whether things are okay to be on Facebook or, you know, Twitter or, or what sort, sort of thing. So those things aren't artificial intelligence, they're, they're learning patterns of the things he's saying no about. Um, but it's taking human, many humans, many hours to train, you know, that machine learning um, algorithm. Get that. Oh, yeah. I have so many yeah. slide comments to make. Not about your comment, but what it suggests, like not artificial intelligence, but real world ignorance, you know, <laughs> you guys can fill in your own nouns. Um, anyway, here I will give you one more example, and then and then we'll move on. Um, I stole this a long time ago, and it's still to me one of the best descriptors of what machine learning is all about. Um, so you know, you're a kid, and your friends are doing something stupid, and you, you well, if your friends if your if your friends jumped off a bridge, would you follow them? Machine learning would say yes because that's the pattern. Exactly. So as good as machine learning is, and to the point we've been kicking around here too, it's only going to be as good as the data you feed it. And yep. really, that's our jobs. You know, I'm the InfoGov guy. What does that mean? Besides the fact that somewhere I have an avatar of me in the Mr. Incredible suit, because it has an eye for InfoGov. Um, and, and I'm the before he's in shape. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> excuse me that's what information governance is that's what records management is it's the care and feeding of this information to make sure that it's accurate you know and and it's you, you know where the single source of the truth is and that's the one you want to key off of and and all that other goodness that i know you guys know so you're actually in a very important spot professionally even if it doesn't always feel that way because of the way i know some organizations sort of look down upon the function. They, they just don't get it. Um, but I, I hope you leave here feeling like, yeah, that, that you get it. That all these things that swirl around, all the shiny objects that float, um, that float by and, you know, bosses just, oh, we need to do that. And then the one goes that, oh, no, we need to do this one now. That you, you're in a position really to help make that determination. So if everything, if everybody jumped off a bridge, would you follow them? No, well, there's more to it than that. Is the bridge on fire? Is the train coming? Or are you just blindly following the herd? Okay, one more thing. So I put, use this image because it sounds like something you would read in some bizarre supermarket tabloid, you know, that turns out to be true. There's no such thing as an AI application in information governance today. I don't think they exist. I think they're all machine learning to some degree or another, but they're not really teaching themselves as much as they are getting better at recognizing those patterns and accepting the human inputs. Michelle is smiling again. Now I'm nervous. I think you're right on that, Steve. I, I agree 100%. I'm <laughs> laughing at the SCTV. Oh, yes, it's fun. I had a good time. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, here goes my voice. I get so excited. But you know, when you when you downplay that, and you say, well, it's just machine learning, but you know, the impact of that technology is really, really significant. I mean, it's, it's, it's enormously valuable. And it can, you know, when these when these documents, like you're comparing, like patterns of documents, we've seen examples like extreme examples where you know, a document is sideways or somebody's tore the corner off, you know, where the half, half of the document's missing. 
again, it can still compare the patterns just fine. We can, you can get enormously yep. terribly terrible quality documents and, and the software can still do its job because there's it, you know, it knows the probability that that is half of a, of a FedEx invoice or whatever. It's, it's, it's a really, really productive way to use software. <laughs> okay. The last on our list for today is RPA, Robotic Process Automation. RPA or Robotic Process Automation is a technology that- Wait a minute. I don't know why it didn't RPA play. Let's or try it again. Robotic Process Automation is a technology that automates repetitive rules-based tasks by mimicking how humans interact with computer systems. The robots in RPA are actually software scripts that automate other software. They operate at the user interface level, mimicking human keystrokes and clicks. The bots can, for example, log into applications, enter data, and copy data between applications. So what's that mean? It's a lot of words. This one, as you can see, it was from Tech Target. It does a pretty good job of writing about all these things. Um, and what this says is, there are so many things that we need to do that are the same every minute, every hour of every day. Why do humans have to keep doing it? They don't change. Couldn't we get a robot to do that? And the answer is yes. So I, I almost want to say, at the risk of, of Ron kicking me under the, the, the virtual table, that what we've done is we've kind of come down a scale of sophistication from AI to machine learning to RPA. But as we come down that scale, we find more connections and deeper connections to the real world. So again, I, I, even though it may sound kind of judgy, I don't, I don't mean it that way. And I encourage you not to think of it that way, but it's all about class. What business problem are you trying to solve? And the closer to the ground level that you can be, the more successful you're going to be at solving those problems because you're taking a lot less on faith. Oh, I keep reading about AI and it's supposed to be, it sounds really good, let's try it. I don't know too many companies that have the resources and the budget and the patience to just try it. The military does and probably the fortune 50 do but the rest of us no we, we're trying to get work done you know we don't have r d departments so a couple a couple comments on that one yep. is uh you know for those and i'm sure you know probably everyone on the call understands but just just to make it clear this this notion of rpa is really just a piece of software and we, we call it a robot or a bot but it's, it's a really fancy name for a piece of software that emulates a human it pushes the keys and the buttons on the screen the same way that a human would so and it's it really is the purpose is to re, is to reduce the amount of mundane tasks that people have to do so if you do the exact same thing i i, I get something off this system i log into this other system and i type that data in that that's stuff that can be repeated over and over again by in an automatic fashion by a robot that is going to save somebody a whole lot of mundane work. And that in a nutshell is really what the RPA thing is about. Now, there's a lot more complexity to it, how you actually build the robot. There's a lot of different tools for that, like a recorder function where you can actually, the robot can actually watch the human do the work and then repeat it over and over again. There can be scripts written like, you know, like almost like C sharp, like a developer style script. Uh, that's that's like the most intricate way to do it to make it perfect, and and some other other ways in the middle, uh, a way of training the robot how to do the work. But at the end of the day, it's really just software that pushes the buttons on your computer screen the same way a person would. So uh, I hope that helps kind of explain a little bit about what this technology even is. It's a macro. I always it's think a macro. Of it as a that's macro. a great way. Yeah, Steve, right on. It's a macro. Right on on steroids. And <laughs> that is the macro, not me. So. Here's something I pulled straight from the knowledge lake, corpus of knowledge. But one of the one of the ways that you guys put it, which I really like, it's 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 all brawn, no brain, or words to that effect. That RPA does the work without you, you. You tell it, you wind it up and say, "Do this," and it does it. it. Doesn't have to think about it. It just does it. Well, not not that it doesn't have to think about it. It doesn't have the ability to think about it. It's just. 
repeating the same patterns over and over and over again. So it, you know, we always like to say when we're talking to our customers or prospects that, you know, it, it takes the work away from your users that they shouldn't be doing anyway. So you need, you need to hire humans to do human work. They need to use their brains. Then we need to intellectually challenge our users doing mundane, repetitive tasks, man, we can get, we can get software to do that. So it empowers your users to do what they should be doing anyway. Great point. I misspoke, but I'm glad you caught that. <laughs> and, and the other little bit of editorializing that I sourced myself on, it does that and not much else and not really anything yeah. else. And that's actually a good thing because here is a well-defined, well-articulated business problem to be solved and it does it. Doesn't have to do anything else. It does this thing that you told it to do. So if you wouldn't mind clicking to the next slide, it, it kind of brings us back to where we were. Thank you. That there isn't a magic pill here. And don't ask me why, but that brought me to the old Pete Seeger song made famous by the birds a zillion years ago. Um, to everything, there's a season and a time to every purpose. So if you've got a purpose, RPA may well have a home. You don't have to get fancier than that. If you need it to be fancier than that, okay, so then there are these other things. But move up that, that ladder advisedly because these things are not panacea. If you don't define the problem that you have well enough, you may improve things, but it's almost going to be by accident. Or it's so horribly bad right now that anything else is an improvement. But that's really not grounds for investing in anything. You really want to think this through, define the problem tightly, and then look at these kinds of enabling technologies to figure out how you can maximize their value in that context. I think that's a great summary um, of those three concepts. Um, one of our attendees, Abigail Austin, asked if you could give a real life example of RPA. Um, and I think you, you guys probably have a lot yeah, I'd be happy to give the, the most generic uh, example that I could use. And it's a common pattern. This pattern's repeated through our business over and over and over, regardless of really what industry or sector. But you, you receive a, a document and we use, as Steve said, the ML automatically classifies and extracts the data off the document. And then the RPA is used to take that, take those extracted data off the documents and actually, just like a human would, actually like log in to a line of business system. Like for example, if you're using SAP, to, you know, as an ERP system, they can log into SAP with your credentials. They can open the, you know, enter a new invoice screen and type the data that was on the electronic invoice that came in. It can type that data that it took off there automatically into that invoice function and submit it to SAP without a user being involved at all. So it's about taking unstructured data and then the RPA tool, uh, emulates a human and, and puts that data into a line of business system. It could be accounting, it could be HR, it could be really anything, it could be a spreadsheet. Uh, but to take that unstructured data, turn it into structured data, and then the RPA bot to do something with it. So okay. it's a common, common use case, common pattern in our business. Thank you. And Susan, you asked if that is an SSO company login. And I'm going to assume um, you're getting a little too in the weeds with that. If it's if you're asking what I mean, um, I think it can be done with an, in a number of ways that are not taking, you know, Ron's credentials and logging in. Right? It could be an admin account or a robots account or you know that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, you would give it the that, ability. But it can be made very secure. Yep. I always think of RPA as a very specific kind of workflow. Uh, Me too. Mm -hmm. That's you know, how I it, explain it. it, it so like, like um, entering timesheet information, especially, yeah. you know, plenty of manufacturing facilities out there that don't really have anything fancy on the back end of their time clock. And somebody has to go through all the actual physical time cards and pull the data off and type it in. Exactly. So, yep. So where, it, when, we, when we wrap everything up, where do we draw the line between artificial intelligence and machine learning. I think the brawn versus the brain, you know, is a really good example. Um, but 
do you have any additional thoughts on that? I, I personally think Steve nailed it. I, I see mm -hmm. very, very little evidence in our business anyway, that AI has ever been used really for anything. It's, it's purely machine learning. It's what we're, what we're doing these days in, in the information governance or the content management business uh, with the document capture space. It's, it's purely machine learning and it's fantastic. It's, it's a really good application of the technology. I'm yet to see a, a really definitive example of, you know, pure, uh, what you'd call general AI applied to our business. It just, it's just not there yet. So how do you More decide? Broadly, oh, okay. I was going to say, how do you decide which <laughs> kind of technology you need? And I know you talked a bit about um, looking at the problem, right? But what aspects of a problem would help you identify the solution, I guess? Well, I'm a, I'm a business process guy at heart. So to me, I'm, I'm always looking about how, how does two words, because it originally was two words, how does the work flow? <laughs> I've been doing this a long time. Um, and I look for logical interrupts. You know, the, an, an obvious one, which we still run across, um, is somebody in a chair who has to take the data from this screen and type it into this screen. It's like, well, if it's electronic over here, how come it's not electronic over here? There ought to be a way to put a piece of plumbing in between so it just flows. Yep. So the nature of the problem there is, is interoperability, really. Functionally, how do I get this to move the way I need it to move more seamlessly? So would you say that's the repeatable part, like the example you're just giving? It doesn't have to learn so much as just be told. It, it When it looks like the X, it always does Y or something like that. Uh, and commonly in, in our business, we see really two distinct types of RPA. And these are, these are, this is a really powerful notion to understand. There's, there's what's called uh, an attended bot and there's one called an unattended bot and an unattended bot it runs like a service in the background so maybe run on a on a pc in a server closet and it does it it takes its information systemically from something like an email inbox you know email comes in i know to wake up and process and it does something with that email it opens some screen and types in some data maybe opens up another something and sends somebody an email in an, in an unattended fashion it's like a service that runs the, but the more powerful and the more common one, actually, that we see uh, that our customers uh, see a lot of benefit from are basically you get, a, you get a new set of buttons on the top of whatever screens that you want to automate. And every time I open this screen and I open that screen and I've got a screen full of data, that's the most monotonous thing. I've got to cut and paste all of these entries over into this other piece of software. Well, I open both screens and then I push the automation button at the top. And it automatically, let's say automatically, it's based on a script or you've already taught it. It can automatically take that data off one screen and put it in the other. And it's hugely productive. And it's to the point where users can almost record these things like macros uh, to transmit data from one system to the other. We've seen a lot of examples about transmitting data. It might be even something like a document assembly. So I've got this big screen, mm -hmm. maybe a, you know, a, an auto claim on my, on my screen, and I need to write a letter, a correspondence to someone. Well, I've got a template letter. I got the screen open. I push the automation button. It automatically scrubs the data off the screen, fills it into a document assembly and automatically emails it to whoever the recipient is. And it, it knows how to do all that. It can repeat it over and over and it never, never gets it wrong. Uh, so anyway, there are a lot of great examples of how to use the technology in a business aspect. What are some other like typical scenarios or opportunities you see this used in? It sounds like in things like invoicing and, you know, forms development and processing of different things. Are there specific areas that are typically low hanging fruit that you might see when you go into different clients? I would say the number one in our industry, by the way, it's not just our company, but it's industry wide, you know, invoice automation is, is roughly 40% of the industry. And then, and after that, it's a lot of financial services. Uh, and that's a really broad topic. We could, we could spend, you know, two more hours talking about just financial services. Uh, but after that, it would be human resources, you know, uh, automating a lot of the, the, the onboarding of, of new employees and all the communication and, and back and forth communication that has to happen between different groups of people. A uh, lot of manual work in there that can be automated. 
uh, contracts management, you know, the, the management of the contracting process within companies is a, is another hugely popular topic. And then in our business, like a gazillion different, uh, public sector, you know, state and local government plus federal government, uh, just an education, a, a lot of really, uh, horizontal application where we're really causing organizations that have small budgets to go further. Uh, so it's not, it's, it's about cost reduction and making uh, people more efficient because they don't have the money and it's, and it's our tax money at work. So creating efficiencies are really, really important thing. So in a nutshell, it are, it are, it are, it are those things, but man, we're uh, like in our business, we're also very, very horizontal. So we get some pretty wild and crazy uh, automations from time to time that are kind of fun because the good news is it's not a tool. Uh, these tools that we're talking about, they're not tools for accomplishing just one thing, man. These are broad horizontal things that can accomplish a lot if, if you just apply them well. So uh, there's some really, really common fits and there's some not so common fits, but there's, it, it can do a lot. Can I take a stab at answering a question that came in to the chat? Cause I think I know, but you're our expert, Ron. <laughs> the question had to do with can interfaces do this? And my knee jerk reaction, cause I get excited about stuff like this is that they can, but this can be a lot less onerous. And a lot, and in my head, I go immediately to the ability to leverage metadata for a lot of it. Where you don't actually have to sit down and programmatically glue these systems together, but there are other ways. And that's why I used the word interoperate earlier as opposed to integrate, because it can be a lot more efficient and certainly more flexible if you don't programmatically tie them together. Well, I'm not anywhere near the truth here because I can handle the truth. <laughs> no, I, you're, you're right on it. The, you know, the real thing is like a lot of, a lot of applications that exist out there in the world, they don't have APIs. There's no way to get the data out except through the screen. So, and there's a lot of green screen stuff out there where, you know, yeah, you may have the ability to program the mainframe, but the backlog in the IT department is like three years long. It's going to take forever to, for me to get the work done. So use the RPA bot, do a query on the green screen, get the data I need, use the bot to do the lookup in another database, grab the rest of the information I need, plug it into a, you know, a Word uh, document, you know, and do document assembly. Uh, it's capable of, as in that example of doing, you know, interoperating with lots of different backends of technology from, you know, green screens on the mainframe to, you know, even like an old DOS application, if that's, if that hopefully, you know, hopefully not, but maybe one of those is still in the work somewhere. <laughs> Uh, to whatever. So, but there's, you know, we see all kinds of kind of crazy stuff that's out there still, but Hey, if it's working, why change it? Right. All right. We're on the next slide. Oh yes. Sorry. <laughs> I got engaged in the conversation. I, I forgot because I'm not driving anymore after PowerPoint blew up. <laughs> Since we don't have questions, I want to go back one and go to the common misconceptions. I like that one. Okay. <laughs> well, I think we've kind of addressed a lot of these. Uh, I don't mind just talking through uh, with you guys some of this stuff. You know, there's there's a lot of marketing fluff out there. That I, that's what I, when I said when we started the call, I really wanted to kind of dispel as much of that as we can to kind of get honest with everybody. But, you know, will AI or ML do everything for me? No, it's just a tool. All of these things, AI, ML, RPA, these are all tools in our tool belt for solving problems, for creating efficiency, for reducing the amount of human stress in the workplace. But no, they don't do everything. They're, they're just tools. Same with RPA. We see there's a lot of uh, kind of craziness going on around this RPA notion in the marketplace right now. Uh, there's a lot of overinvestment, in, in my opinion, we see people that they should be writing, for example, they, they should be writing uh, custom application. They should be doing custom application development, but instead they're using an RPA tool too far. And the danger to that is, is you over automate where you can, you, you basically create the complexity that's, that's not achievable by the next person. So, uh, you know, you have one really, really smart person in your department that over automates, and then they get the next, next job and they go on. Well, you're stuck with, this enormous amount of glueware of gluing systems together and nobody knows how to maintain it. So be very aware and cautious about what, how you're using that tool because you can get into a little bit of trouble. Like if you remember 20 years ago, there was a, a similar tool out there called Microsoft Access 
for example, where you could just, anybody could open up a database and start creating databases. And pretty soon we had 10,000 databases across every enterprise that nobody knew where anything was. And today, oh, that person left. today yeah. that's called SharePoint. Uh, yes, it is. Yes, that's a <laughs> common problem with SharePoint. Absolutely. So don't make that mistake. You need proper governance around the RPA tools. So, uh, and then I love this next one. Uh, all these things are going to result in the loss of jobs. That, that's absolutely not the right way to look at it. Could you look at it that way? Yeah, if, if, if you're an evil person, you look at it that way. But man, I like it like, man, the quality of life for somebody whose day has to be spent doing the stare and compare. I got two screens, you know, I got the green screen on one side and the PC on the other. And I got to take all this data and type it from one to the other. Man, there's, there's just a better way to spend that human's life. Man, can we let the computer do that and get them working on some human work? The, the thinking work where they get to problem solve. That's what our humans should be doing. So and that's, it's not this about- is a big, Yeah, that's a big one for me. And that's kind of why I wanted to talk about this. I, we, obviously I work in manufacturing and a lot of our employees have that like fear, right? What is that? What, what do I do then? And but yeah, really right. what we want them to be freed up to do is to, to play to their comparative advantage. If they have a ton of experience in a particular space, I want them using that experience and leveraging, leveraging that, that not spending half their day cutting and pasting into reports and, you know, doing that sort of stuff, if we can automate all of that. Uh, and it just, it frees them up to do the, the thinking part, like you're talking about. And this is even people on the manufacturing floor, you know, a lot of them are engineers. I want them to be the engineer and, and, and use their smarts to do things, not to be doing all the re repetitive administrative stuff. Yeah, agreed. So, and that last one about reducing cost. Yeah, I do think it, it can reduce cost, but man, there's a lot of other really tangible benefits. Like, like for example, you know, if you got people doing that, that mundane like uh, work where they're staring at one screen and typing on the other as, as kind of a common example, how many mistakes is that human making? Because humans do make mistakes, you know, and that's unfortunate reality, what? but it's true. Yeah. And when you, when you train a computer to take that data and type it over there, it makes a lot less mistakes than humans. So the quality goes up. And by the way, the quality of life for the human that doesn't have to do that anymore goes up. People are happier. And when they're happier, they do better work. They're more productive, you know, in general. So it's, it's, it is a tool that can be used to improve, not only reduce costs, but also improve the quality of life for your people and um, get the jobs done more effectively. I'll we take have a three of them. From, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> we have a question from Abigail. Her head is exploding. Where can she find out more information about robotic process automation? <laughs> well, you can, uh, no, no commercial here, but you can go to knowledgelike.com for a good start. Or, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a whole market full of great information out there. And uh, yeah, a Google search will get you more than you want, more than you want, I'm sure. All I have right, one so last thing to add, if, if I may, just sure. back to, I forget how many bullet points ago, but I've been thinking about, uh, Ron, the, the comments that you've been making about the marketing and how everything, I've forgotten exactly the words that you use, but <laughs> I'll, I'll use the words <laughs> false advertising. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's a favorite bumper sticker of mine, but Another thing I'd love to leave everybody with is the notion of don't take yes for an answer. You know, if you go to, and it's better than it used to be, but if, if you go to a multitude of vendors and say, can, can your tool do this, this, and this, the answer is always going to be yes. They're all going to tell you yes. And if you go look at the websites and you look at the features and the functions, you're going to find largely the same lists with check marks next to them what i'm going to suggest is that you don't take yes for an answer meaning when they tell you yes you say yes how because for some it's going to mean yeah we can get, we we can get it to do that we'll send an army of text to your place for the next <laughs> eight months at right. some exorbitant you know daily rate or others that will say oh just drag this on the screen and, and link them up which may be the wrong other extreme, <laughs> which is why I come back to you. You have to really be able to articulate really in practical terms rather than technical terms, what it is you're trying to accomplish and say, it's like those TV commercials, design a house around this and there's a faucet. You want to say, I have this problem. Tell me how you'll solve it. 
Because they'll all say yes. Yep. Because they all want your money. So uh, the other other point I would make about about this slide around opportunities and tools is, you know, if you're if you're looking for where to get started, always look for what I always call the low hanging fruit. Right. There's always the uh, the application of this technology, which is the most obvious. It's the one that's got the most payback, and it's the one that's the easiest. Okay. So try to look for value and ease. And whichever is the, the combination of value and ease, pick that one first, okay? And don't, don't do the big, the big switch thing, or I'm going to rip out one whole big thing and put in another whole big thing. Start small, get a win. You get, you get everyone in the organization going, wow, okay, look what this thing's capable of. And then you take baby steps. Uh, so all of, these, all of these examples on the screen here, without going through each of these, start with the first one, okay? The data extraction and data entry, that is using these tools to, to, to ingest external information, whether it be from a website, an email inbox, paper from the mail, you know, mailroom type thing. It's all about taking the unstructured external information in an organization, using some of these tools like the ML tools to classify and extract the data off, off of that content, no, mar no matter where the source is, and then using the RPA to, to do the automatic data entry. It's a common pattern here. And it, it, it's basically the pattern for all the rest of those applications down there, like, like accounts payable and invoicing, which if you're looking for low hanging fruit, commonly invoice processing is, is a very good way to start. And you know the other thing we're seeing is there's a lot of, a lot of very mature information governments platforms that have been in place for you know, 20, 25 years now. And a lot of these tools can be used to enhance what's already in place. So no big rip and replace. So, you know, you may have a, a, a big, you know, legacy embedded system that's been there forever and ever and ain't nobody changing it. That's fine. You can still use this, some of this new technology to enhance and streamline the functionality of what you already have. So don't think it's a big switch kind of thing. Well said. Very well said. We did have one question I didn't address, and it was from Amanda Woomer about whether um, ShareGate was a RPA tool. And I'd say sort of yes and no. I mean, it's really a migration tool, but you could say, I mean, in the strictest sense of the word, sort of, yes. <laughs> but well, the, um, I don't think it is in the in the space of what we were talking about here today. I, I think ShareGate's great software. It's really, really good quality stuff. Uh, but but it's, it is a migration tool. You know, where, I, where I'd say that doesn't fit the RPA is, you know, the RPA is about, you know, hitting the keys on the keyboard electronically that the user doesn't have to. It's about automating what the user, the steps a user would take where the migration software is doing a system to system, you know, migration of, of data. So great, great tool. Um, great question. Well, thanks so much um, to you guys, Ron and Steve, and thanks everyone for showing up. I hope this gave you enough information to, um, to start researching on your own and learning more about the differences and being able to really speak intelligently and help your, your uh, organizations understand the differences. I know for me, that's a big deal um, because of all the misrepresentation of the terms that comes through all the time. So I was really thankful to be a part of this. Um, thanks everyone and uh, take care. Happy Thanks, Michelle. Steve, Take great care. to see you. You too. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.